Okay, welcome everyone. Um, so this morning we're going to talk about property graphs versus uh, semantic graph databases. So recently Forrester uh, did another wave. You know probably who Forrester is. It's a marketing research company and uh, several times a year they publish a wave about new technologies and this wave is going to be um, published in August. <coughs> And they're going to focus on NoSQL solutions, uh, graph databases. And uh, we as a semantic graph database company with Allegro Graph were also invited for this uh, wave. And their first uh, question was, so what is the difference between a property graph database and a semantic graph database? Because people keep telling me that uh, semantic graph databases are not real property graph databases. So we came up with this. Uh, table that you see here. Don't try to read it now. One, you'll get this presentation later and I'll go deeper into it uh, uh, at some later point in this presentation. But um, just to be sure, I want to make sure that you guys know what semantic graph databases are. Uh, every triple store uh, on the planet is uh, a semantic graph database. And then property graph databases are the graph databases that don't really do semantics. They might be able to read in some triples, but they're not really focused on the semantic part. And uh, the people in the graph database community, or the property graph community, try to point out that links can have properties themselves. But we, uh, from uh, the, the Allegro graph, get this question every day, and that is, well, so, um, your triple store is not really a graph database, is it? Uh, because you can't do property graphs. And so we get this question all the time, and I talk to people from Virtuoso, so I talk to people from Oracle, and yes, they get that question all the time. So I thought maybe I just should do a webinar to talk about this issue. So what are property graphs? You probably know this already, but a property, in a property graph, both the nodes and the links can have properties. So if you, for example, have some payment events between various accounts, then you can see that the pay relationship actually could have some more meta information like an amount, a latitude and longitude, and the time when a particular payment was made or a particular transaction. Um, and so Oracle got also really um, fed up with this issue about the problem property graphs, so they wrote a really nice paper about all the ways that you can do property graphs as RDF in the Oracle uh, RDF database. And so I would suggest that, uh, um, well, actually what we're going to do in our next email to you, we'll send a link to this paper so you can read it for yourself. But Oracle came up with three different ways to do property graphs in RDF. The first one would be use the, uh, the traditional W the 3C standard for um, uh, verification, yeah, where you have a statement that has a subject and a predicate and then an object and then multiple meta statements about <coughs> the, the combination of subject, predicate, object. So that would be one way. Or for every link where you want to put metadata, you just make a sub-property, yeah, a sub-property with a new name uh, that then has all kinds of additions. Properties. And then the third way, and I think that the industry is going more in that direction, is where you use the fourth element of a triple as a, as a handle for your property graphs, and then you can add whatever you want on this fourth element. So in a Lego graph, we prefer option three, and actually we have an option four. Yeah? So option three would be where we use the graph slot of a triple for the property graph. Uh, but if you want to use the graph element of a triple for your own purposes, then we actually also have a way to use the triple ID for, uh, for the property graph. And so what I'm going to do in the next slide is I want to demonstrate that uh, semantic graph databases in general uh, have property graphs that are far more flexible and far more expressive than the regular property graph databases. So let me give you an example. Yeah? And in the first example, what I'm going to do uh, is show you that our properties can have properties themselves. But uh, unlike um, property graph databases, we actually can point to other objects. Yeah, so in a regular property graph, 
a property can have attribute value pairs, but the values can't be objects themselves. Well, in um, a triple store and a semantic graph database, you can. So, for example, we have this statement that Jans, which is me, weighs 105 kilos. And then the fourth element would be the property handle number one. Yeah, And then the author would be Sophia, my wife. And she's 100% certain. And she made a statement on a particular day. And then we can take the same statement and give it another property handle, where the property handle is the author is Jans, who's only 10% certain that he's 105. Um, and he made a statement on the same day. And you can see that Sophia and Jans are objects in themselves because they have their own properties. And Jans is married to Sophia. Yeah? And because I want to be able to ask both, is Jans married to Sophia or is Sophia married to Jans, I can tell the database married to is of type symmetric property. So it means I can query it in both directions. Now, this is how you specify it in text with uh, triples. But we have a tool called Graph uh, that can display graphs. And it's a tool that helps you to write Sparkle queries or graph queries completely visually. But here's how we actually represent these property graphs. For example, you see that Jans weighs 100 kilo, 105 kilos. And the author of that statement is Sophia. Yeah? And the certainty of the statement was 100%. And the date was this. And so this is how we, and then we can see that both Jans and Sophia are objects that are married to each other. So this is the official way to look at this. And then I can do regular Sparkle queries of Prolog yeah, to query the property graph. Yeah? So for example, if I want to, I can, I can say find all statements about the weight of a person where this person and his wife disagree on the certainty that he has this particular weight. It's an extremely contrived example, but um, anyway, it works. And so here in Sparkle, I would say, well, um, find the property handle of the subgraph person. A, a person has a particular weight, yeah? And this weight has an author person which is the same person as here, and a certainty, certainty one. And then find this, the, another property handle for the same subgraph, yeah, where this property handle has another author, yeah, with another certainty, where the certainty is not the same as the, the C1, it's not the same as C2, and this person is married to A2. Yeah? And if I run this query in a Lego graph, then I get this result. But obviously, this would work in any triple store. Now, uh, if you want to do this in prolog, uh, then we have another way to represent. I find this slightly more aesthetic, but it's actually almost the same amount of text to specify this particular query. So, um, so here in this example, we showed that a property can have its own properties, but these properties can point to objects that can link to anything else. But even cooler is that, um, unlike in a regular uh, property graph databases, we actually can recursively apply properties on properties. Yeah? So this is, again, the same statement, but notice this line here where we say property handle has an author Sophia, but it has its own property handle. And then we say the certainty that Sophia makes a statement is only 20. Yeah? So this is a tiny addition to what we just said. And so if I show this in graph again, our, our visualization tool, See roughly the same picture, but I want you to look at this. So we saw that Jans was 105 kilos. The author of that statement was Sophia, but I'm not entirely certain that she made that statement, yeah, because the certainty is only 20%. Yeah, so now you see that statements about statements have statements themselves. Yeah, and then we can just keep sparkling away. So, for example, if we want to find a person that cannot believe that his wife did something about his weight. And we, I would do it this way. I could say uh, um, a person has a certain weight and give me the proper ha property handle. Then I look at H1 has an author A2, yeah, but it has its own property H2. Yeah? And then I can look at the certainty of this, uh, the second property handle. And I can say, well, and the property is be less or equal to 20. And if I execute this query, then again, I find that particular statement. And again, I can make the statement in, uh, uh, in, in Prolog. So to summarize, one, 
properties of properties, we can point to objects, and we can recursively apply. So this is very flexible and very expressive if you are into property graphs. Okay. So the, what I also mentioned is that not only can you use the fourth element, but triples in a Lego graph actually have five elements because there's also a, a unique ID for each triple. Yeah. So let's look at the statement again that John weighs uh, 100 kilos in this case. And this is the classical W3C way where you have a statement of type of statement where the subject of the triple is John, the predicate is weighs, object is 100, and the creator is his wife. It's kind of a very verbose way to do this. Using the graph element for the property graph is something I just uh, uh, showed you, yeah? where we say John's weighs 100 for statement 1, and statement 1 is the creator and his wife. Using the triple ID, we have a technique where we say Jans weighs 100 kilos and say the unique ID of this triple is triple one. Then I can say triple one has a creator and his wife. Yeah, so now you're free to use the fourth element of the triple uh, for whatever you need it. Yeah? And we even have a customer that uses, we have a customer that uses this extensively uh, to do the property graphs on the ID. But, um, the IDs are pretty unique to um, a Lego graph. So what he does, if he wants to change, uh, exchange his data with other people, then he exports the data as the classical W3C uh, reification. Um, and then if he reads it in his, his database, he basically reads in all the, the classical uh, uh, property graphs or reifications, and then he uses this bit of Sparkle code that to delete the old or the, 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 the classical way of doing this, and then insert um, based on the ID of this particular subject, predicate, object, the properties about that statement. Yeah, so this is one way to do it. And this person is working for the, uh, uh, for uh, a company that does natural language uh, analysis. And so one thing that happens a lot is you analyze stories in newspapers. And you might find a lot of statements about the same person. So what you really would like to do is to keep all the uh, inferences that you make about a particular sentence and tie them together. And so what he does is, if you have the sentence this morning, Jim planned on running to Costco before 6 o'clock, then he actually turns it into this whole um, uh, 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 subgraph. But he ties it together by having a conjunction object that that makes that that makes a, a, a link to all these different uh, uh, statements, and then, um, <coughs> for example, says that this statement might be true. <coughs> so, so that was about the first thing that is uh, that our property can graphs can generalize to, to any depth. But let me take a step back. So look and, and look at this table. So, when we answered Forrester about what is the difference, we, we went through this entire list. And we say, well, property graphs have the have an emerging ad hoc standard. It's the Blueprints API. Uh, we have a W3C standard. Um, and the advantage of having the W3C standard is that you get all the mech you want. You, uh, if you want to change your database, so if you are fed up with the triple store you're using, you can just dump out all your data as triples and read it in as any other database. Yeah? Right? But people really find this useful because then they don't are not tied to a particular vendor. Then, um, in most property graphs, you actually have to define your types and your properties and values up front. Not all of them, but most of them. In a semantic graph database, you can read any data you find on the web that is expressed in triples. You don't have to worry about the schema. You can just read it in. Yeah. But sometimes you want a schema and then you can use taxonomies or ontologies to define the objects that are kind of embodied by your triples. Um, and up, and, and uh, ontologies and tax taxonomies are becoming more and more important in many domains, especially in the healthcare domain. People use uh, taxonomies and ontology all over the place. The financial world is beginning, the pharmaceutical industry, it's kind of a new big trend to use taxonomies and ontologies and semantic graph databases are obviously built to work with that. Okay, the next thing with the property graphs generalized to any depth, and I explained that in great detail. Then um, <clears throat> the other thing that's important to realize is that property graphs are really good at starting at a particular point and then work their way 
through the graph to get to other points and to do graph anal uh, analytics. Um, <clears throat> in the semantic graph database, what we see is we can do the same graph operations, but um, what we've seen in practice is that people also want to do just the regular queries that you would do with the SQL database. Yeah? And so um, triple stores are more like hybrids between SQL and graph databases where you can do uh, queries of the type, give me all the people that have this particular characteristics and have gray hair and have two steps removed from this particular element. Yeah? So it's more what I call aggregated queries. Um, and for that, um, you need a, a query language. Cypher, uh, um, if you look at the, at the property graph, there's a language called Cypher, yeah, where you can specify graph operations, but it's very, very focused on on the uh, uh, graph operations and not on the aggregated queries, whereas Sparkle is very, very much like SQL, and every triple store now has a query optimizer to optimize the queries. Yeah, so if you want to select something like that in Cypher, you have to do your own query optimization by hand. And I no doubt in the future that will get better, but that's the state of the art right now. Um, then when you do semantic graph databases, you work with all these long URLs, and dealing with long strings is really a pain. Yeah? Anyone in the audience with any computer science experience knows that interning a billion strings is a really, really hard. And a lot of the development time for triple stores goes into dealing with these long strings. Um, but we have these long strings because of the fact that we want to get unique names for objects. Because if two people in various, in, 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 uh, in different places make their own databases, then they can be assured if they use the same names for the same objects, then these databases can be just merged together without any trouble. And I'll give you a demo real soon. Um, then we have, or if you want to work with the rules, rules in uh, um, or inferencing in a graph database, then um, that is kind of still in development. Whereas all the semantic graph databases, whether it's an Oracle, Alim, Pertuboso, or um, Big Data or, or Allegro Graph, uh, it's built in. You have the built-in inferencing, and most triple stores even have a rule language. Sometimes it's Swirl, Allegro Graph has Prolog, yeah, so it's all deeply built in. So if you want to treat your database as a knowledge base and, and, and do interesting inferences, it's all built in from the start. And finally, and a, a very important point is that uh, if you want to read in a DBpedia and a GeoNames and a Freebase or whatever else from the linked open data cloud, and you want to read it in a regular property graph database, it's very, very hard. You have just Google for linked open data and your favorite property graph database and within the first Google page, you won't find any solutions on how to really do this. Whereas if you do that with the semantic graph database, it's obviously all about linked open data. So uh, let me let me give you a little demo about that. So this is the state, uh, um, this is the picture that you see here is the state of linked open data in the year 2007. And this tiny miserable picture on the left bottom is the state in 2011, where it's already close to 100 billion triples. But just to keep it simple, here is the linked open data cloud from the year 2007. Um, and so each circle is a few million to up to, up to, to maybe even a few billion uh, triples. And the demo that I usually give for the example is, say, given this cloud, you want to do the query, uh, what is the median income of the area where Barack Obama is born? Yeah? Well, for that, I need three databases. I need the DBpedia, which is the triple version of the Wikipedia, and I might find that he was born in a particular place. And that place will have a GeoNames ID. So I can go to the GeoNames, ID, GeoNames database that has 7 million places on Earth with the latitude longitude and, and everything else. And I might find all the places, say, within 10 miles of the place where Barack Obama was born. So now I have a list of GeoNames IDs. And then I can ask the US Census database, give me the medium income in the place where Barack Obama was born, and give me the data back. Yeah? So what you see is you have three different databases built by people that don't even know each other, yeah? but that really took care of making sure that some of the links yeah, are public and uh, are standardized and are the same 
aimed at other people are using. So here is the English uh, version of the Obama query, and I'll just leave it in for you to read it later. And then I'm going to give you a quick demo of how this works in practice, this query. So I could go here. Let's see if I have this. Uh, late. So here I have a, a web interface to one of our machines. And I could go to DBpedia. Um, and I can go to my queries. Let me get one of the queries. Like, oh yeah, Barack Obama query radius 10 miles, and I can make, take this query. And uh, I already could execute this query here, but let me show you something else. And then I start a federation of databases. So I say, let's take the census database and the oops, and GeoNames database and uh, the DBpedia. Yeah, and start. And now let me do a new query. So I do a query, and I paste the query that I, I had earlier. And what you see here, so here's the query. And, and I just executed, and you found four places with the median income. But let me look at the query. So the first thing you see here, let me make it a little bit bigger for you. Um, you see that in the DBpedia, uh, you find for Barack Obama his birthplace. And then you find the GeoNames ID for the particular birthplace. So now you have the GeoNames resource. Then I call to another database, which is GeoNames. I find the location. Then we use our electrograph magic property to find all the places around location in 10 miles. Yeah, and I make sure it's a PPL. That means a populated area. And then I go to the DBpedia um, census database. And I go to the details of the census of that place, and I look at the population 15 years and over with income in 1999. And then ultimately, I get the income. And so I've executed that, and I could go to one of these places, and I could go to the census, and then I can click on any of these, and et cetera, et cetera. I can keep going. So um, I hope this kind of oh, Let's see how this works. I could take any other president, or most people. Let's see, George underscore W underscore Bush. And I can look at this, and here you can see. So he was born in a slightly richer place than Barack Obama was born. Um, and I guess that's all for this particular demo. And I included the screens that I went through in my presentation. So if you get to see this presentation later, then you kind of can see what I did so far. And I would say that is the end of my uh, presentation. And uh, do you have any questions for me? OK, let's see here. Um, uh, the first question is, uh, where's the pointer to the Oracle paper? Um, so Steve, who is recording this session, We'll send you uh, a link to the presentation tomorrow, and that link will also contain the pointer to the Oracle presentation. I'm going to post it in the chat window now. Oh, it's going to, going to be in the chat window right now. Next one. Um, let's see. Uh, can you talk more about long strings and why this is a challenge? Uh, I think I answered that question. I think already it's a, the challenge is that the, in uh, if you read linked open data, then the average size of um, URL is anywhere between 50 and 70. And so if you have a single machine and you want to read in uh, uh, 2 billion unique strings, then uh, OK, so, okay, let me take a step back. In every semantic graph database, people replace the strings for URL and the regular strings for values with unique IDs so that later on uh, they, they have a more compact representation in memory. And so if you have, say, one or two billion strings, to keep a hash table in memory is almost impossible. So you have to do a lot, a lot of work to make it, you know, to make the interning as fast as possible and printing up the results as fast as possible. Um, so that's kind of the challenge. Uh, and especially if your database is really big, you have to solve the problem. 
Is there more information about your custom example? Um, yeah, we can let me see. We can post a link to that. We have a link to that uh, example, and um, I think it's somewhere on our website. And so we'll uh, put it in our email tomorrow, and again we'll put it in the in the chat box of your window here. All right. Okay. So, can I look at the list of other questions? Um, yeah. So, next question is: Can you give an example or two on the use of taxonomies and ontologies? Can you give an example of the use of? Um, let me go to the question here. So. There you go. Yeah. There was a question here. Oh. Uh, Well, uh, if you, well, I have a, okay, that is a, a tough question. So imagine you have electronic medical records, and these electronic uh, 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 medical records contain unstructured text, and the unstructured text might again contain references to, say, a particular uh, medicine, like a uh, Prozac, yeah? So now you can maybe use an entity extractor to uh, extract the word Prozac, but what are you going to do if you want to do a query, give me all the electronic medical records where someone was taking a mood-altering drug, yeah? Uh, Prozac won't come up. But if you have a taxonomy where you say that taxonomy is, is a, a subclass of something that is a subclass of, of mood-altering drugs, in a semantic graph database, you, when you do the same query again, you now also will find Prozac. So that is one way where people use taxonomies to uh, make semantic search in text much better. And then examples of ontology, yeah, there's a, a million of them, but um, for example, uh, in FIBO, which is an uh, initiative of the banks in the United States, they make an ontology of all the concepts in, uh, how do you call these? Um, uh, securities, yeah, where you can take a security, which normally is represented as text, and you turn it into a big graph of objects that are linked and related, and suddenly you can do queries on the content of securities instead of uh, just doing text search. But anyway, there's a million ways that's something else. Okay, thank you very much. Um, and I think we keep it at this today, and uh, we're done. Thank you very much for your attention.